while pondering another All Saints Sunday, I found myself, oddly enough, thinking about Family Feud. Family Feud is one of the longest running game shows in television history. Off and on since 1976, it has aired nearly 2,500 episodes. And many episodes or segments can be viewed anytime on YouTube. You know how it goes. 100 people surveyed, top seven answered answers. So I was wondering what might be the top seven answers if 100 people surveyed were asked to name a saint. Now I think there's no question who would hit the buzzer first. A Catholic. And they would answer St. Mary, bing, St. Francis, bing, St. Christopher, bing, St. Peter, bing, St. Jude, bing. And if a Lutheran hit the bell first, the answer would be, if they remembered their Bible, St. Matthew, bing, St. Mark, bing, St. Luke, bing, St. John, bing, St. Paul, bing. But, as we have observed on Family Feud, there's often that one last answer that's so hard to get. So if a family member can't remember any more names, either from church history or the Bible, and if it's Cousin Ralph's turn and time is running out and all he can think of answering to the question, name a saint, is Uncle Bob, then he'll say, Uncle Bob. And the family will say, good answer, good answer. Uncle Bob was a saint, went to church all the time, and he was really good and everything. Uncle Bob? Ah. Sorry. I guess no one among the 100 people surveyed knew their Uncle Bob. Nevertheless, from a Lutheran point of view, Uncle Bob might have been a good answer, good answer. And that raises the larger question about saints. Except for the Bible saints, do we Lutherans believe we have saints or not? Would we say Sort of, we're not sure, but we think so, kinda, I guess. Bible saints for sure, how about others? So let's take a closer look. In the New Testament, the word translated saint, agios, is written 60 times. Literally, it means holy ones. And in scripture, it seems to be synonymous with disciples, followers, Christians. When Paul writes to the Philippians, for example, he says, all the saints greet you. To the Ephesians, the salutation says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus. So in a biblical context then, saints were all those who were made holy by being baptized into the body of Christ and who were filled with the holy and sanctifying spirit. Everyone. As time went on and the church grew, however, the use of the word saint took on alternate interpretations. It began to have a more restricted use later being applied to just certain people, certain people who modeled godly behavior and faithful witness. Many of those people were persecuted and martyred for their faith. So it was actually quite natural to focus on them. These saints became recognized and celebrated in part by developing a calendar and commemorating them. The martyrs were named and rem remembered on the day of their death because that was the day that, the, that, they, it w that was considered their bravest witness. And it was also seen as the day of their birth into heaven. Now besides these, the category of confessors also was being developed. The confessors were those who had also endured persecution but who had survived and they were added to the list. But then as the years went on, 
the names of men and women also began to grow according to their local popularity. This varied a lot from location to location. And for centuries, there was not a universal, commonly agreed upon list, nor was there an agreed upon procedure for adding names, nor was there a prescribed day to remember them all. Not until November 1st. November 1st became the day for all the saints who did not already have their own designated day. Kind of a for all means all the saints. Now why November 1st, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Well, that was the day that, uh, that gave the church an opportunity to reinterpret an already existing pagan cultural celebration regarding those who had died. This was a practice that was part of Northern European, uh, Germanic, and, and Celtic culture. Now, this, there's a lot of history here, and I hope I'm not boring you, but it's pretty interesting, really, if you don't already know this. As I said, All Saints Day adapted an already existing ancient pre-Christian pagan a ceremony ritual related to the dead. So, picture, if you will, an ancient homecoming ritual tied to that time when family herders would return from the higher mountain grazing areas as winter approached. This annual homecoming came to include not only living family members, but also, and here's the key, the spirits of those who had died. Now, some of these spirits were friendly, others not. Therefore, people believed, or at least practiced, the idea that it was best during this time not to venture outdoors at night after dark. They also came to believe, however, that these hostile spirits could be bribed with food and drink uh, so as to not then bring mayhem or harm to it, the home and its, and its inhabitants. I wonder if you're beginning to see how the church was able to take this tradition and put a different spin on it or how the church in time and by faith could actually transform this into an affirmation a faith where even carved pumpkins would scare away these evil spirits who had no power. Or when children could dress as the spirits, even those earlier fearful visitors, and be bribed themselves with treats. Sound familiar? So the church selected an all-holy day, November 1st, remembering the saints, which was also known as All Hallows Day in the Old English, and remembering the holy ones, the deceased, the martyrs, and all the saints on this day, which would then mean the night before would be an All Hallows Eve. You know, kind of like Christmas Eve is to Christmas, what Christmas Day is. Or as you probably observed by now, All Hallows Eve, the now familiar Halloween. Therefore, thinking about All Hallow Eve historically this way and, and, uh, and faithfully this way, then Halloween is rightfully a Christian faith response to paganism and linked with All Saints, or All Hallows Day. At the same time, that is over many more years, uh, the development and popularity of the saints advanced, and there were a few problems that came along with that, especially during the medieval period. It was in the medieval period that it was just such a prime time for advanced hero worship of all manners of saints and many tall tales emerged about the saints during this period. Nine saints, for example, were credited with having silenced the croaking of frogs. 
St. Fursi and St. Isaac both spoke before they were born. St. Romwald died when he was just three days old, but he had already recited a profession of faith and had preached a sermon in those first days. So there are many incredible stories around the saints. Uh, and, and, and what happened, especially during the time of the Reformation and later, these stories only serve to further separate the Protestants from the Catholics who were you know, primarily promoting those until the Protestants were trying to move everything in a different direction. You know, in all fairness, I need to say there were eventually universal reforms, and the Catholic councils did a lot of work to clean up their roster quite a bit, so that only saints included after that were those whose lives could be documented. Former saints, Fursi, Isaac, Rumsford, and the nine frog silencers, they were no longer on the list among those commemorated. And then it also happened that to be made a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, you must not only lead a godly life, which we'd all affirm, but you also must be credited for three verifiable miracles, which was never something that the Lutherans ever were quite attracted to. That's just not the way that we looked at saints. We were all, have always been, or since the Reformation, always more focused on the original biblical perspective about the saints, as I described earlier. So, so being just one week past Reformation Day, which also is on October 31st, All Hallows Eve, or All Hallows Day, I guess, uh, All Hallows Eve, I mean, we are much more focused on remembering and talking about the actions of the saints. That is, all those holy ones made holy through baptism. That's where our focus has been, on that biblical perspective, rather than on the character or these miraculous accomplishments of the saints. In other words, it is far easier for us Lutherans to talk about saintliness rather than sainthood. Saintliness rather than sainthood. It's easier for us to talk about what saints do rather than who they are. We don't, aren't too concerned much if saints should be titled or be crafted into decorative statues or paintings or worn around our necks as medallions, because first and foremost, we see that what saints do is the most important things, and what saints do is witness for the faith. In a variety of ways and in all times and places throughout history, from uh, the time of first sharing the gospel in first century Jerusalem, through the early centuries of persecution and martyrdom, through the medieval period and time of reformation, and following that to our modern day, the saints are the ones whose lives have been marked and made holy by the cross of Christ through their, through our baptism. That's it. All saints, therefore, are ordinary people through whom God works. Again, ordinary, like you and me, people through whom God works. The church has its list, and we honor and remember that. But you also have your list. Included in everyone's list are the well-known witnesses like St. Paul, the disciples, early church leaders, the martyrs, the faithful ones under persecution. But we have our own lists as well, including faithful parents and grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts and uncles, Sunday school teachers, co-workers, pastors, teachers, friends, persons this morning for whom we have given thanks, given God thanks and lit candles and tolled bells, persons who inspired you, writers, artists, farmers, medical workers, first responders, scientists, people who could see faith and life and who have seen faith and life knit together, even on Halloween, and who in their own unique ways have been able to share God with you and with others. In faith, we recognize God working through the lives of all the saints we are remembering today. And that's why today is indeed a festival of the church triumphant. 
it's not a sad, it's sad to one extent, but it's not ultimately a sad day because we are remembering God's grace and that by God's grace, all the saints, all the children of God are with God in heaven. And by God's grace, we too are made holy ones. By God's grace, we become saints of God. By God's grace, we are joined to this host of heaven, becoming here on earth what God wants us to be all along, which is a holy Catholic church, a communion of saints, where we trust in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And with all the saints, we say, Amen.